Hello and welcome back. This is the week 11 lecture. So we continue our research paper work this week. I actually wanted to start by just sort of going over our schedule for the remainder of the semester. As you guys know, we don't have a ton of time left. Uh, we only have 15 weeks of instruction and here we are in week 11. So we're getting pretty close to the end. So I just wanted to kind of run down our schedule so you guys know kind of how we're going to approach the research paper for the next few weeks. So uh, step one for us really began last week as we got started on idea generation, like the very early stage of pre-writing, just getting some ideas down. We started thinking about claims. We started to generate some original claims using the topoi. So remember, the topoi can be found in the week 10 uh, overview. Uh, you guys can always go back to that material and generate more claims using those topoi. Uh, so that was step one, just getting started generating ideas. This week, we move into step two. Uh, we're continuing to work on claims. We're continuing to develop original content, original material. Like I said last week, it's really important that we think in terms of original material because these papers are long and we need a lot of content. So we're continuing to do this week what we did last week with claims, but we're also going to talk about the Tolman model, which is basically a model of argumentation, a structure or a framework that we can use to help us get organized. Because the other thing I want us to do this week is to start outlining. So if you look in the week 11 overview, you'll see a little bit of our overall research paper outline. I'm just kind of showing you guys how to plan uh, your intro paragraph, that definition paragraph, and some of your body. So using those four basic sections of the paper that we talked about last week, facts, definition, body paragraphs, which we also call quality and support, and then the policy, uh, your recommendation, your solution uh, to the problem or issue that you're addressing, that policy will usually come near the end of the paper, maybe in the concluding paragraph of the paper. So we talked about those four sections. And if you look in the week 11 overview, I'm sort of showing you those sections in paragraph form. So we can start planning individual paragraphs. That's obviously what outlining is all about. So it would be great if we are at least starting to outline at the end of this week. And then next week, we're going to be outlining very intensively. I would like us to be outlining throughout the week and we're really going to focus next week on building body paragraphs. And we're going to talk about the structure or formula that we can often use in our bodies. We're not getting into that yet. We're going to do that next week. So that's really what week 12 is about. Week 12 is all about outlines. Building paragraphs, especially bodies, because as we know, we need a lot of body paragraphs. Uh, and next week is going to be devoted to building bodies and eventually completing outlines. And then in week 13, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to have video conferences. And I will schedule those a little later on. But you guys are going to be meeting with me if you can make it. I mean, I know it's tough for some people and their schedules. I'm pretty flexible about times. I'm going to assign times. And if the time I give you does not work for you, we can talk through email and try to figure out a better time. Uh, it never fails in an online class that some people just don't show up to their conference, but I like to hold them anyway uh, for the people who do want to show up because they can be very helpful. I can give you a little bit of one-on-one -on -one, uh, instruction. Uh, all you need to do is bring your outline 
to your conference. Okay, that's all I ask. So we have something to look at. We're going to use Cranium Cafe uh, in, you know, through Canvas, so you'll actually be able to upload a document, and we can both look at it. So if you're able to upload your outline, we can sort of go through it together. I'm also going to have you submit your outline so I can look at it in my regular sort of grade view in Canvas. So uh, we can talk about your outline. You can ask me any questions that you might have. You can tell me kind of what you're thinking about as far as uh, the thesis statement goes. And we can just talk about your paper. You'd be surprised how helpful that is. Again, you can ask me questions, express concerns, and I can just give you a sense of kind of where, you know, what you need to do, what you might need to work on more. So that's week 13. And then we're not going to have a, a, a lecture that week. We're just doing conferences, um, and that's it. And then week 14, we really need to be drafting. We need to be working on a rough draft of our research paper because that's going to be a long process. But you should have an outline by the beginning of week 14, so use that outline to get moving on a rough draft. And we don't want to be rushed. You know, so we want that entire week. We really want to use all of week 14 for drafting. Uh, so I'll have some tips. We'll talk a little bit more about, you know, citation rules, how to integrate your sources. That's another difficult thing that we have to work on with these research papers. So we'll cover a few other issues related to drafting uh, <laughs> during week 14. And then our final week of class is week 15. So that's when we're finishing up. Final citation check, final formatting check, uh, and we can talk about post writing. We'll talk about revising and editing those drafts, turning them into final drafts so you guys are ready to submit by the end of week 15. You're turning in the final drafts of the research paper by the end of week 15. And that's it for us. Uh, we don't have a final exam. So after the, that last week of class, we are finished. Okay, but just a, a couple of reminders. We know about the research paper that's due at the end. But now that the rhetorical analysis is finally in, uh, we can really focus on the research paper. But there are a couple of smaller assignments directly related to the research paper that you need to... Uh, uh, just keep in mind, and we're going to talk about the, the proposal later in this lecture. So at the end of this week, you're turning in research proposals. These are not difficult to write. Uh, these are not complex. I want to keep the proposal short and sweet. I just want to see what you're planning to do. I want to see what kind of argument you're planning to make. Uh, this is my final chance to kind of sign off on your project. So uh, the proposals are short. They're not going to take you a long time to do. And I want them by the end of this week so I can just say, hey, your, your ideas sound good. Your project sounds good. Proceed. Or if there's any kind of issue, if there's any red flags I see in the proposal, we can troubleshoot. We can talk. I can give you some advice and you can make a few adjustments before it's too late. All right, so proposals are due at the end of this week, and then at the end of next week, at the end of week 12, the completed version of our annotated bibliography is due. So hopefully this is not going to be stressful for most of us because we've been doing research throughout the semester. We found four sources way back in the early part of the semester, so you just need four more. Uh, if you're still going to use the four sources that appeared on your first bibliography, they can stay on the finished bibliography, uh, but you need to add four additional sources that you are planning to use on the research paper. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in next week's lecture, but hopefully you guys kind of know what to do. We've already done a bibliography. The rules don't change. The format doesn't change. You just need more sources. Uh, so the finished version of the bib comes in at the end of week 12. And then, like I said, I want outlines by the end of week 13. So you'll be submitting those outlines and also bringing them with you to your conference during week 13. All right. And then I don't think anything is due in week 14, except maybe 
if I'm asking you guys to submit the rough drafts, I'll have to double check. I can't remember exactly when the rough drafts are coming in. They might be early week 15, but once the outline comes in, it's just about drafting and then working with those drafts in the final week, uh, which again means revising and editing, polishing, and then submitting final drafts at the end of week 15. So that's the schedule. If you guys can stick with me and stay on schedule, uh, I will. I, I can guarantee that this process will go pretty smoothly. It won't be terribly stressful, and you guys will get everything done. And then once exam week rolls around, you don't have to worry about this class. You can focus on your other stuff. Okay, so let's just talk about the Tolman model as, and I, actually I have a couple of different sort of argumentative models that I'm going to share with you, but the Tolman model is so basic and sort of essential, we all need to use it at least a little bit. Um, even if it doesn't show up directly in your paper, uh, you need to start thinking about claims and evidence in this way. So we're going to go over this structure, but just keep in mind, keep thinking to yourself, uh, just keep reminding yourself about the scope and scale of this paper. Uh, I, I see sometimes with, with previous classes, I've seen students maybe underestimate the paper. They don't plan enough material. They don't do enough, so then they end up not writing enough, and they don't have a well-developed argument. They don't meet the requirements of the assignment, and obviously things don't go well for them. So I know we all remember, uh, perhaps fondly, the old five-paragraph essay model that we learned in high school. And we've even been using that model in college classes, no doubt. I mean, in 101, a lot of the essays that you did were probably relatively short. You might have been able to do your intro, your three bodies, and your conclusion, and that's it. Maybe even on the rhetorical analysis, that type of structure worked for you. But that's not going to work on the research paper, obviously, because the research paper is so much longer. Um, so you just have to generate a lot of content. So that's why we were coming up with original claims last week. Um, and we need to keep doing that. Like I said, keep generating more claims, revisit the topoi, or just keep brainstorming and free writing. But what you have to remember is that while we need a lot of claims, claims are great. Claims alone are not enough. Right. Uh, if we want our claims to be effective, if we want them to be persuasive, convincing in any way, we have to, of course, combine them with evidence. And we already know that uh, on a sort of instinctive level because we've been hunting for claims and evidence in our sources. So we already know that usually after an author makes a claim, they follow that claim up with some type of support, some kind of evidence or data. Um, but now we have to make the transition from just sort of finding that stuff or reading that stuff to now, you know, doing it ourselves. Uh, once we make claims, once we establish claims in our papers, we need to have a nice sort of built-in structure so we can support that claim, so we can do something with that claim, make that claim count. Um, and that's where the Tolman model comes in. So it's just a really easy way to start organizing your argument, uh, to start giving a structure and a shape to each one of the major claims that you've come up with so far. Uh, and the Tolman model, you know, it's been used for a long time. It was created by a British philosopher named Tolman, Stephen Tolman, who just wanted to create a model that could sort of accurately uh, represent the way real people actually argue. He found a lot of other models of argumentation that were used in school or, you know, for any kind of writing instruction. He found them to be too academic, like too steeped in, you know, logic and a lot of subjects that regular people don't necessarily study or know. So he really wanted to capture the way we argue in more common everyday situations. 
So basically, he's just identifying the most important components or parts of any argument. So you can see this in the week 11 overview. It's a very simple structure, a very simple model. We start with the claim, which as we know is a debatable or controversial statement. Um, and we want to establish it as true or at least very likely to be true. Uh, if possible, we would love to prove it, but a lot of claims are going to be, again, disputed, debated. Uh, so if we can't necessarily convince our audience to accept the claim, at the very least, we want, to, we want our audience to accept the claim as reasonable, as potentially true. Uh, they might not agree with it, but they can't dismiss it completely. All right, that's kind of the goal. So we know that. We've been developing claims, debatable, somewhat controversial statements. All right, so that's part one. Part two is the data, the evidence that you're going to use to support that claim. And we have a lot of choices. We have a lot of options when we are looking for evidence. We know this. We tend to use inartistic appeals as evidence. You guys know stuff like numerical evidence, testimonials, you know, the words of others, whether they be experts or like eyewitnesses, uh, you know, graphical evidence, examples that might be provided by our sources. All of that stuff is great. And all of that stuff can serve as evidence. So these are reasons, <laughs> right? These are the reasons that go along with a claim because as we know we always have to provide some kind of reason some kind of basis for most of the strong claims that we make but that's especially important in a research paper all right and then the third part of the Tolman model is a little bit more difficult to define it's a little bit more difficult to sort of wrap our minds around because it remains unstated the warrant the warrant is like a bridge that gets us from the claim uh, to the evidence and then finally to some kind of uh, conclusion. Uh, so it remains unstated. It's not something that you're necessarily putting into your paper. You're not saying it. You're not writing it. But it's like an assumption. It's like a belief that your audience needs to share with you in order for them to sort of get where you want them to get. Uh, again, if you're looking at this like you're sort of building a bridge from claim to reason or evidence and then, you know, to some kind of final conclusion, like you need the audience to share certain values or certain beliefs. They need to share certain basic assumptions about this topic and about the claim you're making in order for them to come along with you as you're moving from claim to reason to conclusion. So these are usually kind of simple statements, assumptions, uh, sort of positions, values, beliefs, but they remain unstated. Uh, they don't actually appear in writing. But they are important because you need your audience to accept the warrant uh, in order for them to accept the larger argument that you're trying to make. So I think I posted an example in the overview, but let's run through a quick example right now. So just a really simple, easy claim. Uh, college should be free in the U.S., you know, for all U.S. citizens or just whatever. College should be free. <laughs> just That's a claim. That's debatable. Uh, that is controversial. Not everyone is going to agree. Most people would probably agree that college is currently too expensive. At least a lot of schools and a lot of states are. But not everybody is going to agree that college should be free for all Americans. So that is debatable. It's controversial. It's going to work as a claim. I know some people will argue with me about that statement. So it's not a statement of fact. It's a claim. So I start there. Uh, and then I need to provide some evidence, some kind of data, some kind of reason to support that claim. So I have a lot of different ways I can go, a lot of different choices, but I'm going to provide some numerical data. 
I'm going to basically say as my reason, look, increasing tuition prices, it's keeping a lot of people from pursuing higher education. Tuition is going up every year, so these increasing costs are preventing a lot of students from pursuing college. So that's a reason, but I'm also going to need evidence right alongside that reason, and numerical data would probably work well here because I can provide some numbers. Uh, first of all, I can illustrate uh, the increase in tuition that we've witnessed over X number of years. You know, I can simply give an average cost of attending college 10 years ago versus what it is now. Uh, I might have to, you know, account for inflation or whatever, but I can provide stats. I can provide numerical evidence. Uh, that would be effective evidence for this kind of claim. But that's not the only thing I could do. I could also provide testimonials. Uh, what if I found a really good source where 18, 19 year old uh, prospective college students are talking about how cost prohibitive college has become? Uh, so I can get firsthand accounts testimonials, the words of others. Maybe I can get experts, maybe economists or people who work in higher ed, people who work in, you know, admissions offices or other aspects of administration can talk about the, the, the you know, uh, drops in enrollment or just whatever, right? I can find evidence to go along with the reason that's really just what I said to begin with, you know, increasing tuition prices or keeping people out of college. So that's a reason. And right alongside that reason, I have numbers, I have testimonials, uh, I have evidence. So there we go. We're in good shape. But the final step is the warrant. So I'm not going to say or write the warrant. But what is an assumption? that my audience needs to share with me in this scenario in order for them to accept my argument. Well, <laughs> again, warrants are also often very sort of simple, straightforward things. Um, so here, the, the thing they have to assume or the value that they have to, to, to share with me is that college is important. College is worthwhile. We want people to go to college. We want high school graduates and all people to have the opportunity to go to college. That's a very basic, simple assumption. But if they don't share that with me, if my audience is hostile to college or indifferent to college, or if they think college does more harm than good, then they're not going to go along with my claim, reason, evidence, final conclusion. They're, 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 they're not going to come along with me. They're not going to accept the premise of my argument. They're not going to accept my evidence. They're not going to accept any of it. So I need to have at least a pretty strong belief. I need to be at least pretty confident that most of my audience will share my belief that they're also assuming, like I am, that college is good for most people who attend if we can just get the cost down. So again, if they don't share that basic assumption about college and the value of college, then the rest of my argument is going to fall on deaf ears. All right, so let me give you one more example. This is kind of a fun example, but it's, it's, it's kind of what Tolman was trying to do. I'm trying to <laughs> sort of capture a, an, an everyday argument that that regular people might actually have. So here's a kind of goofy, silly claim, but it is still a claim. Uh, so I'm at work and I see my friend John. This is a Monday. Maybe we're coming back from a, a vacation and my coworker John looks very red, like very sunburnt. So I'm going to make a claim while I'm talking to another coworker at the you know, coffee maker. I'm going to say, John did not wear sunscreen this past weekend when he went to the beach. Okay. So that's a claim. That's an assertion. All right. Uh, I think it's true. And I think I'm going to be able to produce some evidence to prove it, but it is debatable. Uh, and maybe not everybody's going to agree with me. Okay. So I say, John did not wear sunscreen when he went to the beach recently. And as my reason, as the evidence that I need to provide for that, 
I'll say, well, I just saw him and he looks really red, like just red all over. It's not a natural color. And I, it, that leads me to believe that he got sunburned at the beach. So, uh, again, this is a goofy everyday argument. So we're not using like hard evidence here in, in artistic appeals. I'm just using like a first, <laughs> like a first person observation based on what, you know, I've observed, what I've seen. All right. But now, once again, the warrant is important. Like there has to be an underlying assumption that I share with the person I'm talking to, which is uh, wearing sunscreen will prevent a person from getting sunburnt. Um, <laughs> right. Because my whole claim is he didn't wear sunscreen and that's why he's burnt. So I have to share the belief or the assumption with this other person that sunscreen is effective and failure to wear sunscreen as a result often leads to a sunburn. If this person is a, is a sunscreen denier, if this person doesn't believe in sunscreen, doesn't think sunscreen works, and again, this is goofy, you're not going to find a lot of people who would feel that way, but just to illustrate how a warrant works, like if this person's like, I don't believe in sunscreen, then the rest of my argument is just going to kind of fall apart. Uh, they have to share that assumption that sunscreen guards against a sunburn and not wearing sunscreen will often lead to a sunburn. That's an assumption that I'm not going to state uh, while I'm talking to my friend at the coffee. I'm not going to say, you know, because sunscreen's very effective. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to assume that the other person believes that and is assuming that just like I am. OK, um, but I could be wrong. Right. I mean, there could be other reasons why John is red. So <laughs> there's a potential for a debate. Uh, an opposing viewpoint could be introduced um, and my argument might be successful or it might not be. But this is typically how we build our arguments. We start with those claims. Then we provide reasons and evidence and we're hoping that the person we're talking to shares certain assumptions, certain beliefs with us in order, you know, for the argument to really work. Okay, so that's just kind of an easy way to start putting your claims into larger frameworks. You just need to start doing things with those claims. I know uh, last week you just submitted claims by themselves for Research Journal 10. But in the future, you're going to need to do stuff with them. You're going to need to make moves with them. And you're going to need to pair them with evidence. So that means looking for the right sources, finding the right info in those sources, and then bringing that into your papers. But remember, in other cases, you can use artistic appeals of your own. And sometimes artistic appeals can function as reasons, at least, and maybe even as evidence. Typically, we view inartistic appeals as being the most reliable, effective form of evidence. But pathos, as we learned weeks ago, weeks and weeks ago, Pathos, you know, the emotional appeal can be an effective way to persuade people. And sometimes you can use an artistic appeal of your own. You can use pathos right alongside some numerical data or a testimonial from a source. It's not either or. OK, you need to be using artistic and inartistic appeals. But remember, you create artistic appeals yourself. You generate them yourself, whether it's your credibility, uh, that's ethos, or if you're just using logic, that's logos, and then emotion is pathos, whereas the inartistic appeals, you're finding those usually in sources. All right, so the other structure that I just want to mention briefly, I put this in the week 11 module, but I uh, in the overview, but I don't want us to talk about it a whole lot because you guys aren't going to use the actual structure in your papers, but it's more of like a mindset that you might want to adopt. The Rogerian argumentative model is built kind of around compromise or finding some kind of a middle ground. 
so this was designed by this guy, Rogers. I don't remember, I don't remember his first name. But his whole thing was he felt like in order for arguments to be more effective, uh, the two people arguing needed to have a better understanding of the other person's viewpoints and positions. He claimed, that, and I think we can agree, a lot of arguments just kind of devolve and fall apart because the two people aren't listening to one another. Uh, and they don't really understand each other's argument. So they're just yelling and getting mad. And then I might accuse you of not understanding me. You're not listening to me. No, you're not listening to me. And then the argument ceases to be productive. So his solution was to create this model that kind of emphasizes listening <laughs> and sort of working together. So his structure is basically... Uh, you know, before getting into uh, your own argument, you would sort of summarize the opponent's argument. You would just go through their main points, kind of provide an overview of their larger argument, just to show that you understand it, just to show that you've read it, you've listened to it, you know it, you get it. Okay. And then you state your position. Um, and then you follow up with what's called sort of like the statement of understanding. This is like where you find that middle ground. You find some kind of compromise option. So you're still arguing. Uh, you're still, you know, again, you've already established your own position by this point. But now that you've detailed their position and your position, that third step is to kind of find a compromise to find some things that you agree about in their position, but also saying, hey, I'm still right about this. Like you're right about A and B, but you're wrong about X and Y, and you still need to do what I'm saying in C and D. So, you know, a little bit of give and take, uh, acknowledging that they might be right about some things, your opponent might be right, or they might not be totally wrong uh, about certain things, but they still need to adopt certain positions or policies that you're putting forth. So you, you kind of, you know, create that statement of understanding or that middle ground as a potential solution. Like, we'll take a little bit of what you say, a little bit more of what I say, and we can arrive at some kind of middle ground solution. So I know some of it, that appeals to some people uh, because a lot of people don't really feel like they're very argumentative. They don't think of themselves as being very like confrontational. Um, or, and some, and yeah, argue, arguing can be a little bit confrontational and aggressive. So if that's not your thing, you might want to adopt a little bit of the Rogerian model. Again, we're not, he has a whole structure that, that we're just not really using in our papers, but you can adopt that statement of understanding. <laughs> uh, you can try to arrive at some kind of compromise solution with your opponents. Uh, that can be built into your policy when you get to that policy section near the end of the paper, or it can be something that you develop throughout a lot of your bodies. Um, it's just another option, another way to start thinking about your argument. Okay, so I think that's enough about those. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about strategies for building body paragraphs uh, next week. Like I said, our big focus next week is building our bodies and outlining. But I just wanted to remind you guys that there's a lot of different strategies or sort of like methods of development that you really should be using in your bodies. These are just ways to create content. Uh, once you've established a claim, once you've provided some evidence, these are just some other things that you can do, some other moves that you can make. Uh, you can provide definitions. Sometimes that's important. We've already talked about the definition paragraph, but you can do that in bodies sometimes. You can define terms. You can de you know define the importance of something even. You can classify. That's another method. Some of these things should sound familiar from 101 <laughs> uh, because you were supposed to have learned some of this stuff in 101. I always teach 
definition, classification, examples, narrative, analysis. Uh, I teach all of that stuff in 101, largely so you guys are already a little bit familiar with it and you can use all that stuff in your research paper in 102. So classification, uh, again, definition, uh, a little bit of narrative, sure. Uh, remember anecdotes, those extended examples, examples that often take the form of short narratives. You can definitely use those and you might even find some anecdotes in your sources that you want to bring in. Uh, so that's good. That's narrative analysis. Uh, we just did a rhetorical analysis, so don't forget some of the moves that you made in that paper. Analysis just means digging into something, taking something apart in order to see how it works. So you can be doing that in your body paragraphs. You can be analyzing claims. Uh, from your sources, you can analyze events, you can analyze, you know, uh, ideas, you know, of th that you've encountered or stuff of your own, right? You can show how these things are working. Uh, don't forget about the stuff that we were analyzing in the rhetorical analysis, intention, uh, bias, audience. We can always talk about that stuff with our sources, but we might also be able to talk about that stuff in other contexts. Uh, so in the research paper, you're not just going to be analyzing your sources, although you can do some of that. You're also going to be analyzing whatever it is you're talking about, whatever your topic is, whatever your argument is centered around. So you're going to have to analyze things, people, events, objects, whatever. And just get comfortable with that, providing explanations, illustrating how things work, providing examples, <laughs> and all of those other things. Uh, also, cause and effect and comparison. Uh, those are a couple of other things that I typically teach in 101 because they're very useful in 102. You can always compare stuff to other stuff and remember uh, cause and effect from the toe point. Remember with the topoi, we had some questions about cause and effect, and I told you guys to try to build a causal chain, right? Where your topic falls somewhere in this chain. Certain things caused your topic to exist, uh, and then your topic is causing effects further on down the line. Um, so you can always talk about cause and effect more, and you can always do some comparing and contrasting. All right. So the final thing I want to talk about today, and we'll, we'll kind of return to all of that next week when we are building our body paragraphs. But the last thing I want to mention this week is your proposal. So I've already talked about it a little. I'm not going to go through it. Just remember to watch the video that I posted. It's kind of taken from the business world, but what she's describing is an elevator pitch. And that might be a concept that some of you are familiar with, just sort of a way for like an entrepreneur to attract the attention of a potential investor or somebody who might be able to give them money for their idea. So the, so the whole concept is you're going to make a pitch, a very short pitch about your product or your idea, and you should be able to get through the entire pitch in the amount of time it takes to get from like one floor to the next in an elevator or just an elevator ride. I guess you're usually traveling multiple floors, uh, through multiple floors, but you have to do it quickly. You have to be efficient. So we're going to use that elevator pitch structure, uh, to write our proposals because I don't want to have to spend a lot of time reading these, frankly. Uh, I want to be able to get through them quickly. So I want you guys to follow the structure that they kind of go through in that video. But then also go to the actual research paper proposal and just read my instructions because I'm breaking it all down for you. First, you need to identify the need. All right. So in this case, you're basically just introducing your topic, the issue, the problem, the controversy that you have selected to talk about. Okay, so that's identifying the need. Uh, you're basically telling them sort of why 
this is a problem, right? I mean, you're announcing the problem that you're then going to fix. So you have to establish that the issue or the problem exists. And then you move on to part two. That is the USP, to borrow the language from the video, your unique selling proposition. Uh, so in other words, what is your argument? What is unique or distinctive about the angle that you're taking here, your position, your approach? So this is your argument, okay? So you've identified the need or the problem, and now you're talking about how we address it, how we fix it, what we do about it. That's your argument, all right? Uh, but remember, kind of keep this in that business context. You're trying to sell us. On something, you're you're trying to sell your argument. So make it sound good. Make it sound interesting. Tell me why I should care. I'm a busy man. I hear a lot of arguments. I'm getting pitches all the time. Why should I care about yours? And then the final part, just as as you're providing some more detail about your argument or your USP, go ahead and provide a couple of your main claims. They can even be claims that appeared in your research journal back in week 10. But just what are some of your big supporting points, some of your big ideas that are obviously connected to your thesis, that are going to be in support of your thesis? So just give me one or two key claims that you've already come up with so far. And that's really it. Um, if you want to throw in a little bit of evidence, uh, just some other kind of fun stuff that you've already generated, um, that's fine. But really, I just want you to identify the need, establish your argument, and then mention a couple of other sort of supporting claims so I get a bigger picture of your USP. And that's it. Keep these proposals brief, one paragraph. You really don't need any more than five sentences, but I want these to be polished. I want these to read well. So you don't have to write a lot, but make sure you proofread. Make sure everything looks good, sounds good. Make sure everything is clear, all right? Because if it's not clear, if it's confusing, obviously I'm not going to invest money in your idea, in your argument. So sell me on it. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know, and I'll see you guys next week.